All right, so let me uh, do a little introduction of our speaker here. Now, George Murphy is, uh, has been a member of NBCA since 1978. He's a charter member. He served as president of his local Smoky Mountain section. He's also been a director at large. He served as national treasurer. And of course, he's currently the national technical director for Mercedes-Benz Club of America. He's uh, spoken to our group, our uh, at most national meetings since like 1986. He's a concourse judge. Uh, he's re a retired uh, uh, nuclear engineer. He's had at least 15 Mercedes of his own. He works on his own cars. He's got this really neat business called Performance Analysis Company that does some, some things that no one else does, repairing uh, pieces of Mercedes that no one else repairs and providing some upgraded parts uh, that are uh, no longer available pretty much any place else. And I'll tell you from my, my association with George doing these uh, VTCs, I really enjoy the interaction uh, beforehand and during these presentations. George is just a lot of fun to uh, have as your, uh, as your guest and your speaker. And so I really enjoyed this as well. So uh, please uh, uh, join me in welcoming George as our uh, presenter today in, about restoring a barn fine Mercedes. George, please take it away. Okay, let me see here. I got a big arrow there for this time, so it's much easier to see. But, uh, I'll give you the benefit of my experience of doing this in, on a few cars. And also, people who have called me and have found a barn find or a long stored car and did all the wrong things, and uh, they call me what, what to do to fix them. So uh, we'll try to get into those things, talk about do's and don'ts on this. Uh, well, again, this is based mostly on experience of several cars I've done. And uh, in response to questions from people, <coughs> found a, a barn find, a long stored car, and did a few of the wrong things. <laughs> I'm trying to recover the thing. Like they come along with a battery and a can of gas, think that'll get it going again after 10 years. Or in one case in 20 years. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Anyway, next slide. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming car has been parked and left for a number of years. Um, little or no service history on it. We're lucky if you hear some, which is good. But make sure you own the car. Make sure you got a valid title in hand, signed bill of sale. Don't start anything on it until you do that. So it's an important thing. Here's a nice skull wing that uh, I don't know whatever happened to that. But we'll look at it from a system approach on these cars, which way you want to look at. and. Uh, restore or at least you know get operable so uh, it'll work fuel system uh a lot of these cars are over three months old you, you got to drain the tank because they probably had e10 fuel in there uh, ethanol wasted stuff ethanol's been around since about 2004 or five and uh it's after three months old it's pretty bad stuff you got to get it out of there because it separates into water uh and once you drain the tank, add a gallon of diesel fuel to flush it. And uh, when you got the outlet strainer out, you know, it's going to run out. You're going to make a mess, have a bucket to catch all this stuff. But diesel fuel is nice to use because it doesn't have the fumes and everything if you make a spark. So uh, once you get the tank flush and, and it looks reasonably clean, put a new outlet strainer in it and a fuel filter on the car. This is assuming it's a fuel-injected car. The fuel filter is right forward of the tank. Older cars, filters up by the engine, but uh, uh, the older cars you'll probably want to leave that off do the flush. Uh, want to put real gasoline into the tank if you can find it. Uh, some states uh, they kind of hide. Tennessee, we've got real gas everywhere practically, but uh, there is a website you can go to find out where to buy real gasoline without ethanol in it. And uh, contact me for that website. It's called, I uh, uh, can't remember it right now, but anyway, it's a good thing to have. But, uh, oops. Uh, disconnect the fuel line at the engine, jumper the fuel pump, that flushes the lines of the engine. That's what I did on a car, I, several cars I had. I was able to run the fuel pump and, and uh, flush the lines out. It's got a return line to the tank, flush it also, figure out a way to some jumper hoses or something, run the, the uh, fuel pump and it'll 
pump fuel through the feed line and through this jumper you put to the uh, return line back uh, to a disconnected hose at the tank so it runs out into a bucket. That's in case you get some really rotten fuel. So uh, main thing is get get the fuel system as clean as possible, especially the fuel injected cars. They uh, they, they can get pretty uh, cruddy with them. Brakes, and climbing out, do not push the brake pedal right off the bat. You're going to possibly push the uh, uh, master cylinder pistons right into an area of the master cylinder that is kind of cruddy or other, whatever. And the point is, uh, pushing that brake pedal just pushes all that crud, scores the seal, and you may have to uh, change out the brake uh, master cylinder anyway, or at least put a new kit in it. Might have to do that anyway, but uh, don't uh, jump in there and push on the brake pedal right away. Uh, any car over 15 years old, replace the brake hoses. In my experience, uh, they uh, they can start getting a little bad. I had one experience with my 124 car. At, yeah, it was 15 years old at the time. I was getting it ready for autocross, and uh, I noticed one of the hoses had an aneurysm in it, a little bump on it indicating that the internally had ruptured so stopped and put all new brake hoses on it uh, you want to bleed the brake system uh, use a pressure bleed if it's got abs you must use a pressure bleed you can't pushing the pedal just doesn't do it with the abs pump in the way the abs device just doesn't work uh, and again i don't use a pumping method if you can avoid it don't do it Inspect the brake pad thickness, brake pad thickness. Uh, if below specs, plan on putting new ones in. Uh, I had an MGA, a 1960 MGA I, I got, and uh, it still had original new pads in it. That was wonderful. But uh, if, if they're uh, worn down, you know, plan on changing them. Uh, some Mercedes-Benz, if you look at the master cylinder reservoir, has two little rubber caps on it, little bumps. And those are the switch, low pressure switches. And if they're an old car, they're probably cracked and they're going to leak with a pressure bleed. They're just going to bleed for, uh, brake pressure right out on the painted surfaces here. I like this uh, motor products. It's a nice one. It's got a little hand pump. You can pump it up to whatever pressure you need, pressurize the brake system. And use that. And it makes it really easy. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, this, uh, uh, generally new hose 15 to 20 years flush it every two years and use good brake fluid uh, Tevis ATE or Mercedes-Benz fluid which is Pentosin brand uh, pressure bleed is most effective on ABS cars don't use silicone fluid silicone fluid is good for race cars because they change it every time but uh, on an ABS car, they recommend do not use it. Uh, does not absorb water over you know, a long stored car. The water droplets remain little droplets rather than absorbed in the fluid. And they'll work their ways down to the caliper piston, causing rust eventually. That's a big reason not to use silicone fluid. Uh, I know some people like to use it just for street driving. It just isn't right. Uh, pure race cars, they use it. but. Uh, I do have some procedures for doing the brakes and resolving sticking calipers. I've restored calipers that most people would, would uh, say, oh, it's stuck, we have to get new ones. No, they're not. They may be stuck a little bit, but I've, I've got them free. So contact me if you uh, want that procedure, because I've, I've been quite successful in restoring disc brakes without having to put new calipers on them. As long as they don't leak, my philosophy, if they don't leak, they're okay. And uh, But they, they need some exercising and I have a procedure for doing that so uh, ignition systems plug wires distributor cap and rotor uh, the internals of the distributor uh, make sure the vacuum plate works enough running pre-75 cars uh, eventually convert to breakers ignition it's much better uh, ignition service and you don't have with points as soon as you start the car with new points they start to wear keep that in mind and yeah, it runs fine for a few mi uh, thousand miles, but they, they wear down. I like the breakerless ignition. Matter of fact, I put breakers on two gull wings. You know, they come with uh, dual point ignition, almost impossible to set up without putting them on a sun tester. But the electronic ignition put in those gull wings 
Actually, they were, one was a roaster, one was a bellwether. But the point is, they make a big difference in performance of the, uh, these older cars. So it's something you might want to consider. Electrical system, fuses, oxidate, uh, uh, oxide. <laughs> Just in running their car, for instance. Uh, I go in and I rotate each fuse back and forth in its clip. And that'll restore the conduct, conduct uh, the electricity <laughs> through the fuse. Just rotating the fuse in that spring clip and it cleans new surface. Uh, make sure the engine to ground, engine to frame cable is there. That's your main ground between, completes the circuit back to the, the battery. So make sure that's there and it's tight. 92 and up in the mid 90s, a lot of, this is a sample of what kind of a degradation you'll see in the engine wiring harnesses. And uh, any car in that vintage uh, hasn't been changed, you may have to change it because this is the kind of thing you, you might see. The, uh, some of the fact is the car is just running fine until somebody disturbs the wiring. They move wiring around for some purpose, maybe to change spark plugs or whatever. And once it's moved, the insulation just disintegrates. And of course, you've got bare wires touching each other. You probably get bad operation. So very common in the mid-90s cars. Automatic transmissions. Uh, change the fluid, but, you know, warm it up before you change it in a car like that. And... Uh, Get it nice and warm. Make sure you drain the torque converter and the uh, cooler. They hold the fluid also. And if you do that, it, it may take more fluid than you'll see in the book. So point is, when you're refilling an automatic transmission, always only put in four quarts to start with and then start the car. That way the pump will transfer the fluid into the torque converter. If you don't, uh, if you try to put, like most of these transmissions take say seven, uh, not God, I think. Take seven quarts. Well, put in four, start the car, and add the other three. But if you try to put seven in, it'll overflow on the floor. You'll you'll see it. So. Call from Davis. Uh, excuse me, that I, had, I just turned off. Call from Davis. Jason. Go away. Okay, but uh, keep it all clean. Generally, service. If you get an old car, check the date codes on the tires. Uh, if you're over 10 years old, put new ones on. Um, I'll get into the story of this car that I restored a couple of years ago, but, uh, what they look like. Power steering, same with the trans as transmission. Change the fluid after it's warmed up, about 20 miles on the road operation. And then I have a, a feed and bleed operation I use. You can email me for that. It's pretty easy. Uh, you essentially disconnect the uh, return hose, uh, start the engine, let the old fluid run out while adding new fluid. Make sure the old fluid is running out in a new bucket under the car. And keep adding fluid while it's running. Have a, have a friend cycle the steering back and forth. Be surprised how much crud will come out and how much better the power steering is after the car. I restored the 20 year old system that way. Everybody thought, oh, it's shot. And it wasn't shot at all, it worked fine. Cars with hydraulic suspension, uh, 6.3s and 600s. A few people go after 600 anymore, but there's a suspension reservoir make sure, uh, on the air suspension. Make sure the alcohol is in there and uh, it absorb, get some moisture out of it. Change the fluid filter in it after 20 miles uh, road operation. Again, that, that operates the pump and everything else, kind of gets things moving. And there is a filter in the uh, in these systems, and we plan on changing it, adding new fluid, that sort of thing. There's a feed and bleed operation works well. Engine, plan on oil and filter change. Uh, I like to clean the engine up a little bit, uh, either using you know uh, WD for not WD40 but uh, Ajax or something, spray it on there, uh, and brush it on. And, Hose it off with a, with a cold engine. Just be careful of the electronics if they're on the engine. Replace the belts, they're gonna be, if they're old, they're gonna be, uh, they're gonna have bumps in them. Spark plugs, uh, if they're fouled or the wrong plug, put the correct ones in there. Coolant, uh, you can check the pH, get a pH meter. You wanna make sure it's between seven and eight, it's okay to start with anyway. Eventually you'll wanna change it. And make sure you use the Mercedes-Benz brand uh, or Xerox, Xerox, Xerox 05, makes it 50%. And uh, trick I use is uh, don't mix it outside the car. 
if you've got a when you're done you got the whole system drained then uh, put in the requisite amount of antifreeze let's say it's a 12 quart system add six quarts of the of the antifreeze then top it up with water now you won't get six quarts of water in the 12 uh, 12 quart system but put in water to top up the system start the car let it warm up you'll notice uh, the coolant level will drop as it's circulated then you can add water again but that way you know you've got at least 50 percent of antifreeze in there always watch the engine temperature on the first start make sure the thermostat isn't stuck open or closed and uh, other leaks stuff like that so there's a lot of vacuum lines on the older cars and uh, if they're they get hard with age and then they crack and then they leak vacuum and that affects the door lock system the climate control system uh, and older ones the cruise control and all that so take a look at all those vacuum hoses uh, in the engine compartment because heat and time you know take their toll on them gearboxes uh check the fluid levels do a fluid change in them if you're ever gonna uh, change the fluid, always open the fill plug first. Make sure you can get it open. Don't don't drain it not knowing whether you can open you can open the fill plug for obvious reasons. And uh, differentials uh, have a vent on the top. It looks like a tall bolt. Undo it, clean it out. And uh, but the uh, the reason I say open the fill plug first. If you drain it and you and you can't get the fill plug open, then what are you going to do? How are you going to get the fluid back in it? Hydraulic clutches, check and replace the fluid. Uh, some cars want to check the operation before towing it. Uh, put the, if it's a manual transmission or an automatic, put them both in neutral if it's going to be towed or loaded onto a flatbed. But uh, when you push the brake pedal, uh, the clutch plate could be frozen to the flywheel or all kinds of bad things <laughs> that are going to re require transmission removal. So be aware of that with the clutch. And here, here's some cars I did some uh, work on. I had a 72 uh, 300 SL 4.5, had the air suspension on it, sat for 10 years. It only had 40,000 miles on it. The car was absolutely immaculate. And uh, the owner had tried to start it with the gasoline from his lawnmower, which is an oil and gasoline mixture that had sat for quite a few years. It was stinky stuff. We had quite a time getting the fuel system clean on that car. Once we got that clean, got it running well, that uh, did a few other things, transmission fluid and engine and all that kind of stuff. But that was uh, that was quite a challenge. Uh, I had a 1982 ADSL. Had, uh, looks, that's about looks like a mine had little wipers on the headlights. But anyway, it was uh, it was uh, quite a nice car, and uh, it just needed going through and freshening up everything, given its age and neglect. Another nice car I had was this little coupe, and that's one of my favorite uh, older cars. And it had twin be Zenith carburetors. Those who have ever had these can either curse them or <laughs> change them out to Weber's. And uh, you can do that. But I found some tricks with the Weber's, or well, not with the Weber's, with the uh, Zenith. That uh, the typical problem with them, and uh, it involves a stuck heat heat riser in the manifold, and it continually routes hot exhaust gas up under the carburetors. And overheats them and they warp the carburetor base warps or there, there's a plate there and it warps so uh, i learned that i took the heat riser and wired it open permanently and then readjusted the chokes on the zenith uh, to compensate and that car ran just fine and cold but that was a nice little car it ran ran well latest project i had a few years ago was this 1990 500 sl and uh uh, it was something. It was stored in a barn under a cover, cloth cover, for 23 years. Had 38 miles on it. Oh my, I was astounded. It was located about 80 miles from where I live, 80 miles west of me. And uh, the uh, executor of the estate of the owner of the car, who the owner died, the executor uh, somehow got my name and called me and asked what to do with it. And uh, I volunteered to. Uh, get it going again make it saleable he wanted to sell it of course so uh, uh i went out and looked at it and uh it was interesting so i'll get into some of the back background on this it started out bellevue washington is where the car came from and he sang the car with rick cole in california and, and this car traveled california on a flatbed and then it went to darien illinois to the 
corner again on a flat bed and Richard Jordan traded a race car for the car. Nobody had titled the car. <laughs> so I had the original title for it. Even the president's executor of the estate did, did not retitle it. But anyway, so the car was trucked all the way over and it ended up in a Mr. Dean's garage in Crossville, Tennessee. Uh, that's about 80 miles west of me. And that's when I got into it. He, uh, he contacted me to try to get it going and find a buyer. So that was quite a project. Uh, we, of course, we had the flatbed of the car. When I went out to get it, at one point in its transfers, the uh, uh, unknowing uh, tow truck driver or flatbed driver with it didn't know how to put it in neutral and uh, he forced it into neutral. And in those cars, they have an interlock between the ignition key and the neutral and it pulled the cable out of it. So uh, that was the first thing I noticed. But we got the car and, and uh, hoisted onto the flatbed. Yeah. Aside from that, about 12 gallons of old fuel. Uh, and it was kind of funny. Uh, it didn't smell bad or anything. It was clear as water. And then I was told it was aviation fuel. It was apparently lasts a lot longer than gasoline, maybe even 23 years. I'm not sure. But uh, that's, that's about what I got out of there. But, uh, and here's the, the story on the ignition switch. And I had to fix that. Replaced the fuel filter and <laughs> the battery. Uh, obviously, it was dead. <laughs> Total dead. It wouldn't even take a charge. I didn't try to take a charge. I looked in on it and, and the plates in there were just, they were just powder. There was nothing, no fluid in there, no acid or nothing inside the battery just powder after 23 years so it all absorbed somehow but I put in five gallons of fresh uh, non-ethylene fuel we have that widely available here in my area so that was the fuel and uh, prepared the engine for starting here I pulled the cam covers all the valves worked okay oiled the cams the valve train really good and uh, got ready pull the spark plugs put a few ounces of ATF in each cylinder uh, crank the engine over just by hand with a wrench, uh, with a great big handle and a wrench. Just m turned it over okay. It was got a couple of revolutions on it and it was, seemed to be okay. Then I electrically cranked it with the battery. Watch the oil pressure come up. It did. So those those are all the, the steps I, I had to take, you know, just to get the thing going again. Get the engine ready to go. And uh, Start the engine, of course, with all that oil I had put in the spark plug holes. Uh, it looked like we were fumigating the neighborhood for mosquitoes. A lot of uh, white and smoke, but uh, it cleared up pretty well, and it just idled quietly and smooth like a new car, which it what it was after about 30 minutes. And uh, so engine, transmission, that took it for a drive. Everything worked fine at that point, came back. Now, if we had a real problem with the soft top. You had to raise it manually, and uh, it, it, it was uh, hard hard to get it latched and everything else. The fabric, uh, uh, surprisingly, was in like new condition. I thought it'd be mothy after 23 years, but I guess it was uh, it was stored properly. Uh, it was stored in, in uh, here in Tennessee in a closed barn, heated in a concrete floor. So uh, that might have had something to do with with uh, it was not too bad. No moths got in there, apparently. <laughs> but the uh, air conditioning system was down on uh, Freon, and at that time, they, they still took R12, so I topped it up. I had a bottle of it, and I topped it up. The hood pad just was dust. And of course, it was new several 23 years ago. It was just dust. I put a big blanket over the engine brushed it all off and put a new pad on it, new plastic pins. The plastic pins broke as soon as you tried to pull them out. On that car, there's plastic pins hold the hood pad in, but uh, it was badly disintegrated. Then the, the tires or something else, they were, I forgot what they were, Bridgestones. They were Bridgestone tires, and uh, they were flat-sided. Uh, and the flat part wouldn't didn't go away when they were fully inflated but uh, flat on the bottom from the weight of the car sitting for 23 years. And uh, obviously I wasn't gonna keep them on the car, but uh, I drove it down to the local shop down here to put new tires on it. It's quite a bumpy ride because <laughs> the tire did, would not round out at all. But uh, they, they were kind of funny to look. The uh, tire shop guys, uh, 
had a big laugh. They just set the tire over by after they took it off. They just said, "Oh, there it wouldn't roll away. It just sat on the flat side, <laughs> sit there." Radio and amplifier. I had to send those out for a refurb at Becker Auto Sound. Uh, reason why? Uh, Twenty-three years, the heat and cool cycles, everything else. The capacitors leaked down in the uh, in the electronics. Of course, that radio had capacitors in it, and the amplifier. They have good sound systems, new, but uh, they had to be refurbished. And uh, Becker Auto Sound went through them, got it all working just great. It sounded well, sounded like it should. A new car. Flush the brake fluid, and the brakes were just fine. Really tested them. And things came out pretty well in as far as that goes. So, uh, not for but the soft top was a big problem. It only went up halfway automatically, uh, and uh, we pulled the uh, top module, cleaned the pins, uh, got rid of the fault codes. Uh, I still I sent it off to Beckman Technology. They tested it, said everything was fine. So at that point, I, I was at my wit's end. I took it to our dealer in Knoxville. They had a guy who was supposedly an expert in the 129 soft top or top systems. They worked on it for a week, unable to repair it because uh, he found two hydraulic problems and they, put, and they replaced them with new ones. And the new ones leaked. Brand new ones from the Mercedes-Benz parts they leaked off the shelf and he says, yeah, they've been sitting on the shelf for 25 years. So uh, that, so I said, that's enough. <laughs> they, uh, uh, I took, uh, took it to an independent shop who had a guy who, who more now, now the dealers won't do that, but I did it individually. I took an independent shop and he took out all the cylinders, flush the systems and we sent them off to top hydraulics. Uh, there are other kind of companies that do this too, top hydraulics. Uh, went through everyone, put new seals in them. Two of them had bent shafts, brand new, and the shafts were bent. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were bent from trying to operate the top or uh, from brand new, but that kind of surprised me, but uh, uh, bent shafts. So uh, I can understand the seals being bad, but uh, bent shafts, I don't know. Right from the factory, maybe they came that way, which is bad news. Oh, by the way, if you've got a 129, I was told two years ago that there were no more cylinders available from Mercedes-Benz. So don't buy, don't, uh, number one, number two, if they say they have them, they're going to be as old as the car. They're going to leak. Just take the existing ones and top hydraulics or somebody that does this and uh, fix them. Uh, don't depend on new old stock hydraulic parts uh, that are sitting on the shelf and the seals will leak. But anyway, the independent shop got the top working perfectly, everything else. And uh, I was quite happy with that. It was quite a job. I ran and drove as a brand new SL. Gosh, it was, it was quite a car. And those of you who have 129 SLs, you know what they're like, especially when they're new. And uh, this is coincidentally, a uh, car sold for $38,000. And <laughs> there was a guy in a uh, broker. So, took a transaction for me and out of uh, Jacksonville, Florida, sent it to the truck to pick it up and the truck stopped and they had four other, I would say expensive cars, Porsches and Mercedes on there and had space for this car. And the driver, uh, we drove the car onto it. And I, I, and he said, I said, here, do you want the title? He says, oh, the guy says, you don't need the titles in the Middle East. <laughs> Apparently these, these oil rich sheiks, they, uh, they don't bother with titles. They just drive the cars, and when they quit, they park them by the road, have them picked up the helicopter or something. But it was it went to uh, somewhere in the Middle East uh, to a collector who wanted low mileage Mercedes Benz. And that was that was quite a story. That was what the the buyer told me. So uh, that's where it is. If anybody wonders where it is, if you're considering recovering a '96 or newer model Mercedes, they have more complex electronic systems than you're used to seeing in older cars. And there's a great article in Hemmings Motor News. Here's the URL. It's pretty long, but you know you can copy it down and, and try it. It's a good long article on what are we going to do with, let's say, uh, uh, 2015 car in, in 20 years. Uh, what's it going to be like? Uh, and they talk about in this article is uh, the electronics aren't going to be available. 
you'd be lucky if there are some spares available. But uh, they explain how these the cars with all the new electronics in them, you know, they're they're designed and, and built and manufactured by an outside company for say GM and Mercedes Benz, which is Bosch mostly, but uh, GM, Ford, and everybody else, you know, they have their own buyers, but there's just so many of them made for the production. They, okay, they may make a few extras, but, but after 20 years, maybe those extras are gone. Now there's there's none left, no, and they're unrepairable because of the way they're built. They're, the uh, the components are right on a printed circuit board, but they're they're part of the board, so to speak. Uh, they call it high level integration. I mean, I'm not an electronics engineer, obviously, but uh, looking at older electronics, you know, you, you can see the discrete resistors and capacitors, you know, with the little wires sticking through holes in the board, and they're soldered on the underside. Yeah, those can be fixed. Those are repairable by a knowledgeable electronics guy. But you look at some of these newer uh, boards, I've seen them, and, and, and they've got a coating on them for one thing. And you can't see these devices. They're, they're in there, but you know they're all part of the board. And uh, of course, any testing require maybe de determine that a part is bad in there, how you gotta change it, you can't, it cannot be changed. So we're going to replace or going to face some real problems here in restoring cars in 20 and 30 years because of the electronics they're putting in them now. So but I, I do recommend uh, get this article, read it over, and uh, maybe help you decide whether or not what cars you want to uh, pick up and restore in, in a few years. So, because here we're 2020, and you know a, a 1995 car that sat for a while. It's gonna it may have some electronic problems. So, for more information on my experience or my files, contact me. Here's my email address and my phone number. And uh, I'm here mostly weekdays. And if you get a recording, just leave a message. I'll get back with you. But uh, I have reams of information and experience on the different cars. Be glad to help you if you want to call me or email me with your problems. Uh, not be a, on just restoring a car, but any problem at all. So I'm I'm available. So any questions, I'll be glad to answer questions. So I, I thank each of you for participating. I especially thank George for hosting this and doing such a great job in answering all these questions. And we certainly hope to see you at our future events. Thank you. Make it. <laughs>